I know that you all feel, as I do, how important and how lucky and how much of an honor it is to be here uh, this evening. My name is Meg. I'm just a volunteer with 350 Seattle. Um, Meg. That was given the privilege <laughs> of getting to sit up here with these folks. Um, mostly you're going to hear from them, but I get to make just a few, um, a few statements first. Uh, the first thing I want to do is give thanks for this space that we get to gather in this yeah. evening. Um, the lovely folks at Soul Repair have donated the space. They are stewards uh, of this space here, but we also want to honor the fact that we are meeting on land that we know uh, is stolen, um, was violently taken from the first peoples that lived here, the Duwamish and other, other peoples. Um, and at 350 Seattle, we always recognize that the land that we are on here in Seattle has been stolen. I'm gonna stop talking and give these folks a chance to introduce themselves, um, give a little bit of background. Uh, you know, I think everybody knows your name, but we're gonna hear your name, hear the, the pipeline that you helped shut down and just give us a little bit of background um, on yourself. Hi everyone, I'm Leonard Higgins, really happy to be here. Yeah. In your very cool city of Seattle. Um, I, I've lived in Oregon my whole life. I was recently introduced in Montana as Everyman, and, and I like that a lot. I, I'm the least likely person to be doing this kind of action and, and really um, see that as a hopeful uh, pathway for my fellow citizens yeah. who need to step up and take responsibility for the time we're in. I'm Emily Johnston. Uh, Annette and I shut off the two pipelines in Minnesota. Um, I think everybody in this room, uh, you know, knows why we did that, and it's it's doing this uh, these speaking things that we have just started a couple weeks ago doing is always a little bit surreal because it's such a great way to engage with people who are super supportive. Um, but we all, and, and it's therefore fun, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But we're also here because we're all terrified. Um, and we did what we did because we are terrified. And so, you know, we, uh, you know, I will speak for myself and just say that I think that actions like this are incredibly important right now. Uh, the system is completely failing to respond to the situation that we're in. Um, and I hope everybody here will think seriously about all the different ways they can engage in this fight. Thank you. All right. I'm Annette Clapstein. I, as Emily said, was uh, in Minnesota, and I am a proud member of the Seattle Raging Grannies, who are, uh, as you can see here in force tonight. Um, I have been an activist pretty much all my life since I was a teenager. Um, I have, you know, also felt complete despair and terror about climate change and where that's going and what that is already doing to our poorest and most oppressed communities and what it means for future generations. Um, we, you know, in the grannies talk about doing things for our, our grandchildren, and our grandchildren have no future if we don't stop fossil That's fuels. Right. So this is uh, what, you know, what is important to me and important enough to me to put my body on the line, and I think everybody in my age group needs to be out there doing the same. Yeah. Hi, I'm Michael Foster, and I got to be in North Dakota. <laughs> Thank you. So who yeah. else has Thank been you. in North Dakota recently? <laughs> Let's hear it for all the people who have been in North Dakota recently. Um, I, you know, I've been working in climate uh, with 350 Seattle and other groups. I work with Plant for the Planet Kids. Um, last Saturday, a few days ago, we, sh we planted uh, tree saplings that had to be held up by a little stick. And these saplings were cloned from the DNA of some of the world's largest tree stumps. Wow. Wow. 
These giant coastal redwoods need to migrate north as climate changes to Puget Sound. And we had five, six, eight, 10, 12 year old kids planting these giants out in Jefferson Park on Saturday, way up above sea level rise, way up on top of the hill, because these trees could live until the year 5016 easily. If we take care of this place, right. mm -hmm. right. when we plant a tree, we make a promise to the future. So that's the kind of thing I've been doing, but we can't plant these trees unless we shut it down. We yeah. have to shut it down yeah. at the same time. So anyway, thank you all. And, and, and there's no way, I, I don't know if I can speak for all of us, but I think I can. Um, we can't, we couldn't have done this as isolated individuals. There was this incredible community and movement and growth that we're all part, each one of us comes from a great, amazing community. So I just wanted to say that we're here doing this because we're able to do this, all of us together. Thank you. I am Ken Ward. I live in Corbett, Oregon. I shut down the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Um, I've been asked by my attorneys to prepare a list of the things that I have done working on energy and climate uh, preparatory to trying to offer a necessity defense, among which you uh, need to argue that we've attempted or no legal available avenues of solving the problem are open to you. So that's been an interesting exercise. Um, and uh, the first thing I recall doing uh, was to write as a college student in Massachusetts. I wrote and uh, got introduced and lobbied for a piece of legislation that would have tied Massachusetts vehicle registration fees to the fuel efficiency rating of the car. So if you were driving a Delta 88, which was the worst at the time, it would have cost you $200 a year. Sorry. And if you were driving a VW book, you would have gotten a $40 rebate. Um, and I found, found my, uh, my uh, statement of support, and, and I argued that it was probably not a good idea to burn up all fossil fuels and finite resource, which polluted. Um, so anyway, I've been working on this for a f***ing long time. <laughs> So you all have been working on climate issues for a long time, but you also worked for many months to plan this action. Can you all talk about sort of the conception, that moment when um, the idea first came up and how the planning proceeded? How did you all five end up doing this on the same day? This guy's going to trial process. next month. I am currently scheduled to go to trial on four charges in Skagit County on January 9th. We'll be there. Yeah, we'll be there. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you. That'd be great. Um, what was the question? The question was how did we come or, up? His idea. Yeah. Conception, origin of the, of the plan. We stole it from Canadians. <laughs> the people have maybe seen this, but, the, but there were uh, activists in uh, Montreal and other parts of Eastern Canada who uh, did this technique first and put it up on YouTube. And uh, some of us saw it and we thought, hey, <laughs> we could do that. <laughs> and we thought about doing it uh, in a very localized way around the trans uh, mountain line first. And we thought, why not do it in a bigger way? So that's, that was the origin of it. Cool. So um, you guys probably remember Break Pre and Anacortis. Um, <laughs> There, there were several of us that were involved in that, a uh, couple of us um, that were on the railroad tracks there. And um, we found that 
that the facts, uh, the attorneys have a thing, they call it a fact set. And the fact set, you know, what we did blocking the trains coming into the refineries there was not a perfect fit for the necessity defense. And so that, you know, was the germ also uh, for us getting together and starting to think about uh, what would be the perfect fact set for the necessity defense and what would be an action that really could grab people's attention, really communicate the emergency, um, and uh, demonstrate what needs to be done, not only stopping new infrastructure, but beginning to ramp back on the current usage, which we have to do. This was an incredibly safe action as well, in terms of you all pulled it off very safely. I'm getting some, I'm getting some pushback. Emily, why don't you talk about that? No, not pushback at all. I love this question. Um, because, you know, it, it, so in Minnesota, when we were in jail, uh, we got to watch the uh, pipeline company representative go on uh, uh, repeatedly, over and over and over again, saying like, how unsafe this was. Um, and so, you know, there, there are actually a lot of responses to this, but there are three main ones. Uh, one of which is, these are the emergency shutoff valves, mm -hmm. okay? Their, in, their, their intended use is for emergency personnel to use them to shut the pipelines down uh, if there's a, you know, wildfire or some other emergency nearby. Um, so, you know, if it's not safe, to shut off the emergency shutoff valves, yeah. then <laughs> we have a problem. <laughs> right. um, the other thing is that Enbridge, the pipeline, uh, the company that whose pipelines we shut down, uh, in the period between 99 and 2010, uh, logged, I, I forget the number right now, but I think it was 804 spills. That's one every five days. So in other words, it's not shutting these pipelines off that's the problem. It is operating them that that's is right. the problem. Thank um, you. And then, and, then, and then finally, of course, the real reason we were there is that there is a 100% risk of catastrophe if we do not shut them down. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, top that. <laughs> so I would love to hear more about that physical act and what that moment felt like for folks watching Michael turn that wheel. <laughs> You didn't see the saw, bed of saw the exhaustion. Yeah, so I got the biggest wheel. I felt like I felt like I felt like Mickey Mouse and Steamboat Willie, you know. And uh, that little clip you saw went for like ten seconds. I was doing that for about a half hour, and and towards the end, I, I confess I was stepping up onto the wheel and just dead hanging my body weight until I was like a raccoon with my ass on the ground, <laughs> dropping off, laying there, standing up, climbing back onto the wheel, and doing it again for another half turn. So that went on forever. But, um, but yeah, I, there was a moment when uh, I realized they had not shut it off, and things were vibrating, and it was really scary for me we had done a lot of research, we had talked about what it would be like, and I knew that this was to be expected. But it was, it was, a, it was a powerful feeling, it was a, a moment of commitment to say, okay, this thing is vibrating, the ground is vibrating, and this is what's supposed to happen. 590,000 barrels of oil are stopping underneath my feet, and I'm gonna keep turning this valve. Yeah. Emily and I were the ones who lucked out, as you saw on the video. Uh, it, they remotely shut it down, and we were the only pipeline that did that. So our only uh, physical challenge, as you saw me there, <laughs> is I couldn't operate the bolt cutters worth the dam. So. <laughs> so Emily had to cut most of the chains. So there was a little bit of physical risk, at least um, in, in North Dakota, but you all have risked many other things to do, uh, to do this action. Um, risks you knew um, that you were doing that, and you sacrificed time um, and more time in court, and you're risking uh, possible prison to come. Um, 
what do you think the largest sacrifice is that you have made or that you foresee making as part of this action? Um, I don't know about as part of this, this action specifically. You know, I mean, I kind of think that I went through a door that, that I never was able to go back out when I started doing this kind of work. Um, and lots of things got left behind, or at least, you know, their presence in my life was radically reduced. Um, I used to, like, read and write and stuff like that, and I don't do a heck of a lot of that anymore. Um, but uh, there are also a tremendous amount of things uh, it gained, and you know, I think this community is incredible. Um, the way in which being engaged in this fight uh, has actually uh, made me feel much less despair is incredibly important, um, and I feel like I'm doing like the most important work that has ever been done, basically. And and I am one of many many people engaged in this work, and uh, you know, I think almost all of those people are just fabulous. Um, yeah. And so it's not really about the sacrifice so much, even though there have been sacrifices. Um, I, I think the biggest uh, sacrifice is um, family and friends uh, around me. Are, they're, they're the ones who are experiencing the, the biggest impact here. Um, we all knew what we were doing. We had a lot of time to think about this. Um, so it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, the things that we're facing are things we have imagined for a while and are comfortable facing. Um, other people who are family and friends and loved ones, some of them didn't even know about this uh, beforehand, are abruptly having to face those same kinds of worries uh, and so forth. And so I actually, and I would just echo what Emily said, I, I feel like we're kind of privileged, we're in a pretty much a privileged position of being able to attempt to do something about which most people don't even want to think about, let alone, you know, try to figure out how to do do something about it. Some everybody's here because in some way you're all grappling with ways to figure out. So we're all ahead of the game right there. A lot of my friends through the years are people who are in professional staff positions with major environmental and in some cases climate organizations who are having to get up, who I actually feel some sorrow for because they are, have spent years now of having to get up and go in to work every day and do a bunch of stuff that isn't going to work, isn't, isn't working. And I think they actually face a higher degree of pain and existential problem than we do. Uh, it's kind of a relief to be out, out here. Question. I'll, I'll Is there something that we could do to help support your family that, you know, that you think that would be that's a great question. Is there anything that support from this community or support that your families need? We, we have a pretty cool team of uh, support volunteers in the room tonight who helped put this t event together and who have done all kinds of things for us. Could you raise your hands, people who are part of that support team? Thank you. Raise your hands. So thank, thank you. That's what I meant earlier, this community. Um, and as far as that question goes, um, the night before, the day before we shut the valves down, we did a drive-by to check the site. And I remember being terrified that the sheriff was going to be sitting there waiting for me when we arrived the morning of the action. Uh, because, you know, our, our security was sort of okay. Uh, it was brilliant. It was, our security was brilliant. Oh, yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Yes. So, so I was sure they were going to be there waiting for us. And we had talked about, you know, should we drive on? Should we, what do we do if they're there? And, and how to just not be noticed and find another spot down the road. Um, and I had a moment the evening before when everything kind of clicked into place and I saw a vision of myself stopping the car at the site with the sheriffs parked there, getting out, getting the bolt cutters, walking up to the sheriff and saying, I need to get in there. I came a long way to shut off this pipeline. <laughs> because, because 
This is the action we committed. This is the thing we envisioned doing, and it feels great. It's the right thing to do, and being here, telling the story, sharing these moments, and going to trial, this is all part of the action. So thank you for being here and sharing in our story. Right. Yeah, I think I'd like to add that um, I think we are in a tremendously privileged position that we even get to make a choice about doing something about this, where there are people right. all over the world in indigenous communities like at Standing Rock in the Philippines where they're getting hit by a super typhoon, it seems like, every other month, um, who have no choice but to grapple with climate catastrophe already. And so I don't feel like, morally, I have a choice either. I absolutely feel it is my duty to do anything I can to stop the fossil fuel companies yeah. and the capitalist system from ruining yeah. this earth. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like a great segue into thinking about, I mean, it sounds like it's necessary for you you feel that it's necessary for this to happen. Can you all talk a little bit about your legal defense? Um, Leonard mentioned it um, once already, but it's based on the necessity defense and the fact that you feel exactly as, the, as you do, that there's no other, other form of action that can be taken. Can you all talk about that a little bit more as a legal strategy? Uh, the necessity defense is part of Anglo-Saxon common law. Um, uh, the usual example is uh, if uh, someone is walking down the street and you see a house burning down with a kid inside and you, you know, break through a, oh, I don't know, a chain link fence, let's say, um, to get the kid out of the fire. And, the, and then uh, if after the fact you're then charged with trespass and burglary, um, you can go into court and say, yeah, I did those things, but look what I was trying to, uh, you know, so look at the problem I was trying to solve. So we're, we're trying, we want to do the same thing. We want to go into a court and say, you know, the world as we know it is ending on a pretty quick timeline and tar sands oil is top of the list of the things we ought not to be doing. So we, you know, broke through a chain link fence and went in and did the metaphorical equivalent of trying to remove the kid from the burning house. Um, and it, it, when, when the when the necessity defense is accepted, um, uh, the uh, judges uh, can then instruct a jury that if we meet the terms of necessity defense, then in effect we did not break the law on the things that we're charged with. It's a very difficult, rarely, often attempted, rarely allowed defense. Um, a part of our sort of strategy here is we think that we should be arguing a necessity defense everywhere where we are acting um, for those reasons, whether or not the odds are high, um, because it's the, the broader case for what we're doing and why we're doing it is, in, is well encapsulated and made in the necessity. Um, yeah, so one of the things I've been saying to people is that you know, when you do something like this, especially something with such high legal risk, um, it, you know, it kind of makes people, you know, look at you if they're not deep in this movement and say, that's crazy. Why would somebody do something like that? And the fact that the, when somebody says that, it gives us an opportunity to explain why we would do something like that. And only if you're willing to take uh, a, a lot of personal risk are people going to take you seriously in, in certain ways. And they may otherwise think you're just making a lot of noise or they may think that you just have a different opinion and you should just do this or you should just do that. You know, whatever ways they find to sort of dismiss and minimize what you're doing get shifted. They don't get uh, to totally erased, but they get shifted by civil disobedience when you're taking a real legal risk. And so, it gives you a kind of um, authority. I mean, like, you wouldn't be listening to us if we hadn't just done this, you know? <laughs> and you're our friends, a lot of you, <laughs> you know? And so, I mean, it's really, it just gives, it gives you the opportunity to say things in a way that resonates differently with people. Um, and I've had a couple of my dear friends say that it actually feels, they, uh, they understand the problem of climate change 
differently, viscerally, in their bodies now as a result of my having done this. Because they know very well that I don't want to go to jail, um, and they know very well that like I'm not crazy. And so the fact that I would do something like that uh, you know, has changed the way that they think about the world. And, and for me, part of the necessity of defense is uh, showing that it was necessary to do on that day. If the pipeline companies had somehow been convinced to leave the locks locked shut the way we left them uh, on October 11th, then that would have satisfied our obligation to this current generation of young people for 2016 and for part of 2017, if we don't want to violate their constitutional rights to life, liberty, property, to the air and water that they will require, which has been recognized in the Our Children's Trust Yay. legal cases, <laughs> which I happens to be part of organizing <laughs> here in Washington State. And that was a big deal. And those kids have been fighting in court and winning in court for two years, and they can't get the Department of Ecology to do anything. So it became necessary for me to shut it down. And um, yeah, and halfway through 2017, we would still need to go out and find five more pipelines worth of oil to stop burning. Okay, Sign me up. let's do it. Sign let's me do up. it. Let's do it. I'm ready. So Emily, you were talking about getting people to feel the effects of, of climate change and the need to take risks in their bodies. Uh, I happened to be at a reading that you did last week in which folks talked about, in fact, uh, your poetry having that effect and getting people to, to feel um, the direness of the situation in their bodies. And I think that we have a copy of your, your book here. <laughs> um, and we, ha we had some requests from the audience for, for you to share a bit of that, <laughs> that experience, if you would be willing to read um, one of your poems. Uh, for the cause, honey, for the cause. Yeah. Yeah. For those uh, of you who don't know, Emily is a, a very excellent poet, and she has a book called Her Animals. Um, out that was nominated for an award here in Washington State. Yeah. So, so and, and when we talk about, you know, not being able to do the things that we would normally do with our lives because of climate change, we're also missing out on some, fa you know, some fabulous art and writing and things that would be happening. All right, here's a nice short one. <laughs> uh, when I open the door, you lean forward, smelling of coffee and leaves and sun. Your hands gather me. In the middle of the field, you. In every room, a vase. Encore, encore. Oh, shy. Thank you, Emily. I want to read my, one I like. <laughs> just, just take a second. They're very short. This is eight, this is torture eight. Emily night. This is this is eight through eleven. I'll be really quick. Sentimentality may be part of the problem, but I cannot help my weakness for the greatest and smallest, massive elephants and vast whales. Thumbnail-sized frogs, brilliant and paper-thin blue butterflies. For any viable cluster of those to survive until you read this, I'd give my life, painfully, every day for a year. But no, I haven't given up my car. Yeah. Well, I did for a while, four years. Then I did the harder thing, working with other people. <laughs> Persuasion usually failed me. People more or less know what they think before you open your mouth, and generally they stick to it. I might have been more effective if I had described our policies and behaviors as lunatic less often. <laughs> or maybe not. But uh, 
Michael, you mentioned, you know, people, large Hollywood types giving to, to this fund. How much are these legal fees? What are, what are we looking at now? We've raised, we've raised a bunch of money on generous donors, uh, lots of people giving a little bit, and what is it around now? 70 something, and we need about $100,000 more to cover all the costs. So you have because to it's not lot. just us, but Reed here and Sam are our, our awesome support people who had not planned to get arrested, also got arrested and charged with felonies. And um, we still have Steve who made that video you saw. Um, he is the only videographer who is still charged. And, and we were able to get several pro bono attorneys, but particularly in North Dakota and other places, there's just a, a lot of demand, as you might imagine, for, uh, for pro bono who's, attorneys. Who's so facing charges we're in having North to pay Dakota? some of them. Who's facing charges in North Dakota? I hear the voice of my great granddaughter singing, keep it in the ground. Singing, keep it in the ground. All right, so you all were uh, lovely and did your part and put questions uh, up for us, and we've got them down in front of us right here to read um, as we reconvene and uh, hear a little bit more from these folks. Um, I'm going to pull off here some things that folks starred. Uh, sounds like more than one people would like to know. And one, of, one of the questions has to do with support folks, um, how those people are doing, how the filmmakers and documentarians are doing. Uh, if somebody can talk about that. Yeah, I think Reed should talk about yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. let, let that support Reed, folk talk. Reed, the other value. Reed, 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 Reed. So the question is, how are we doing? How are you, who are you and how are who you? Who are we and how are we doing? Um, I mean, we are people who, you know, believe in the same things as these fine folks here. We just found a different way to help out. Um, and at least in the case of myself and Sam, we're facing about the same charges or level of risks with one, you know, one degree of sort of separation, you know, saying like, oh, you, it's like a charge of uh, accountability in my case, like, oh, you <laughs> helped them do it or you didn't stop them from doing it. So um, we're in kind of a similar uh, legal boat as them. Um, uh, for myself, I'm, I'm doing quite well, I think, uh, considering the circumstances, you know, uh, uh, you know, just kind of getting along with life, going to school next quarter, um, you know, got a lawyer now, things are great. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so as far as how we're doing, who we are, um, yeah, I'm just another normal person like them. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to ask Reed a question. So Reed, Let's get the microphone on you so people can hear you. So, so Reed, um, what happened? Um, you know, I got arrested and they hauled me off in the squad car and as far as I knew, um, they were going to let you go and, and we didn't ah. even expect you to get arrested. You didn't trespass, yeah, yeah you didn't cut the chains. What happened? Yeah, uh, so kind of a strange story. Uh, yeah. So, so we, we went out there um, and, you know, Leonard did his thing. It was great. Um, I live streamed him from the, uh, well, I didn't live stream because we didn't have service, but I took a video of him and posted it on Facebook from the public road next to where he was. Didn't trespass on anywhere. Um, the deputy showed up some, you know, 45 minutes later um, and uh, questioned me and the filmmaker who was there, um, took Leonard away, um, and then me and the filmmaker headed back to town to try and, you know, call the jail and see how Leonard was, when is he, he going to be out, that kind of thing, can we post bail for him. Um, they didn't have anything for us yet, they were still processing him, um, so we went out for some lunch in the town and a couple of sheriffs uh, pulled us aside. I, I was in the grocery store <laughs> uh, after I checked out and took me into the station for questioning, um, which is optional, by the way. Um, always remember that. They, they give you a piece of paper to sign that says, I consent to you know, being questioned, and you don't have to do it. That's, you should always do that. Don't talk to the cops. Um, 
But they did that, I did that, I left. Um, and, you know, called a lawyer and it's like, oh, I'm a little suspicious. I think they, I don't know what they're thinking to do with me, but they can't seem to make up my mind. So what should I do? Um, so the lawyer is like, oh, you should probably, you know, leave town for the minute and, <laughs> and do your jail support remotely. He'll probably be in there for a little bit. Um, so I thought, okay, smart idea. Um, and so, you know, packed up the car, took off, was driving down the road about five to ten minutes and, you know, police car lights in the background. I get pulled over and uh, it's the same deputy who was at the pipeline earlier and they arrest me on the side of the road and take me in and uh, tow the car away. And then it's like a day later and we're in, in the jail, I like knock me on the window and Leonard sees me, the look on his face. He was not expecting that, neither was I. Uh, so that's how that happened. I, I don't know what, what, what went down with Sam. I think he was arrested at the scene. Yeah, so <laughs> that's that. And I'll add, um, our videographer was not arrested at all, and neither was our support person. And, um, you know, Emily and I were in jail for two days, got out on bail, we all went home, and like 10 days later, our videographer gets mm -hmm. charges in the mail, and he still has charges against him. And the really funny part about that is that we all got arraigned the same day, uh, like you know, a month after that. Um, and they were trying to, the, the prosecutor was trying to get bail for Steve, who had come, who had flown in from New York. And you know, the purpose of bail, I don't know if you all know this, but is only to make sure you're gonna show up for trial. It is not meant to be punitive in any way. Uh, and so the fact that he had flown in from New York and they were saying like, now we want you know $20,000 bail and we want you to, you know, completely ridiculous. Let me just report also on the uh, other, so in Washington, uh, Lindsey Grazel and Carl Davis, well, my experience was being arrested and sitting in the back of the deputy's car and then listening to the radio chatter um, because uh, they originally when they showed up, they, they looked at Lindsey and Carl and said, you're trespassing, you need to leave. And Lindsey said, okay, and they left, <laughs> which was the plan. And uh, I'm sitting there listening to the radio chatter and uh, they describe my Jeep and the registration number, and then they describe Carl's, and then they start describing, reading information off their IDs, and I'm thinking, this is not a good, this is not good. Then they start asking for priors, and then they ask for a tow truck, and I'm trying to figure oh. w which one's being towed. Uh, so anyway, they, they were all arrested. So in that, in that case, the charges have been suspended. They have not been dropped out, right? And what we heard last uh, week uh, from the prosecutor was that they are going to review the video card that they now have a subpoena to look at, uh, taken from uh, Lindsay's camera. If they, find, if they don't find anything on that that would uh, allow them to recharge, then they will in fact drop, drop the charges. And that's also, the, as I understand it, that's also the case with Dea, um, that the charges have been suspended but not dropped. Um, so that if they were able, in either case, to find more evidence, um, then they, they would, in fact, charge him. But, of course, they didn't do anything, so it should be okay. There, there was only one person who was so affable, awesome, and just otherwise, like, lovely, that no one even thought to arrest this person yeah. on site. And he's standing right in the middle of the room. Ben was the only person on site at all of the locations. And the cops never, not during, not after, touched him. So thank you, Ben. Or he's a fed. Yeah, I did want to ask a clarifying question. The Shut It Down Legal Fund, uh, that is also going to help these folks, the videographers. And so if you thought you only had five folks to support, just know that that number is a little bit larger and maybe put another buck in on your way out the, yeah. Out the door. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of questions that are um, some variation of what next. And also, you all, you all started something, and there's an energy and a momentum that we can feel because of your commitment to this action. How do we scale that, and how do people 
participate in, the, in that energy and in that momentum that you all have started? Uh, that momentum, <coughs> sad to say, has been greatly uh, improved by the recent election. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And there are an awful lot of people who are, you know, I'm part of 350 Seattle, as a lot of you know, uh, an awful lot of people who are getting in touch with us to basically say, what the hell can we do? Uh, we want to do something now. Uh, and so we are doing our best to sort of um, uh, develop a structure that will f uh, fit that need um, and train up a lot of folks to do things uh, and engage people in all the meaningful ways we possibly can. So, you know, that is one thing. If you, you know, are not engaged in a group, you should be engaged in a group. This is something that needs to be a movement. Uh, like, we all need to work together as much as possible. Sometimes it will be small actions. Sometimes it will be really large actions. Sometimes it will be illegal. Sometimes it won't be. But we need to do all kinds of things right away, starting now, starting, you know, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, we have a terrific community of activists here in Seattle. I think sometimes we don't understand how lucky we are, and there are many, many groups involved in climate justice work and other kinds of justice work and other kinds of environmental work. And if you don't have a place to be, um, I think, you know, talk to just about anybody here, but there is a lot of work to do. You cannot work within the system because the system does not work, so, um, you know, I mean, there are things you can do, testifying and things like that, but um, I think with things as they are, we all need to be out there in the streets doing direct actions on a regular basis because shutting them down and hitting them in the money is the only thing that gets their attention. Yeah. Right. I, I do want to do a, a shout out for work that other people are doing that is not direct action. I very much see what we did as in support of folks that are finding a way for us to transition from fossil fuels to alternative energy. I have a shout out for the Children's Trust case that Michael was talking about. And I'm so thankful for the, the stand at Standing Rock. And so uh, there's so many things that people are doing and so for me, I just ask everyone to really look at the inside themselves, at their talents and what they're called to do. There's so many things that need to be done. So maybe a follow-up question for this. I want this. This sounds like a very personal question um, from whoever wrote it. So I, I, I think it would be nice to put it out there. Is there an appropriate age? to engage in this type of action that you all, you all did. Uh, somebody who is who's concerned about um, spending a lot of their life in prison. Proportionally, you all are maybe less. So, I'm wondering if you can did speak to the- Did she just totally diss us or what? <laughs> I would, I would like to say, I, I read, I read, I read Annette's um, description of her desire to act for people back there and was pretty much moved to tears um, uh, because it means very, something very, very much to me that people who are in generations above me are caring for my future. So I would like to say that. And at the same time, I identify with the fear of the younger folks who are concerned about getting involved with direct action at a very young age and spending a large portion of their life in jail. So, uh, a bunch of answers to that. Um, the, the absolutely, we think that like this is the responsibility of older people first and foremost. No question about it. Because right. we pay, we're less likely to pay any price because they look like bullies when they come after folks. You know, the older they are, basically. You know. Sh Shelly's still here, <laughs> uh, you know, and, uh, and also, um, you know, and even if we do pay a price, that price is by definition lower because 
like we have a felony on our records and it's hard to get a job, but if you are, you know, well along in your career or you don't have a job anyway or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know yeah, or you're retired, like that ma that matters a whole lot less, right? You know, and also like, you know, Dea, when, when, uh, when Dea was still in jail, she actually spent the most time of any of us in jail before she was bailed out right. for a variety of reasons, but the, um, and, and not able to talk to a lawyer, et cetera. You know, and she was the only one of us who, like, is in her childbearing years. And so even a few years, you know, she's like 35 or something, like, could conceivably make the difference, uh, well, no pun intended, between being able to have her own child and, and not being able to have her own child. So, like, these are all things that we understand are huge choices, very, very personal choices for people. And, and we think that because of that, this is the, the burden of these kind of actions should fall on older people. On the other hand, you know, and, and there are also a million ways to engage that are not illegal that won't end you up in jail. Um, on, on the other hand, there are two things that I, I will sort of modify that with, which is that one, everybody needs to do what they need to do. Um, and, and if people feel really strongly about something, I think they should do it. You know, and, and that is the state of the world right now, especially because, you know, as privileged Americans, we are in this position where we can have an impact that a lot of other people can't have. We're in a system that might conceivably still respond to us, and, and, and that is a huge part of the problem. And therefore, I feel like the burden is upon us, and, and, and for some people, that will be, even if they are younger, they will want to sort of stand up for that and, and do the work of, um, engaging with that as deeply as they can, and they may end up spending time in prison. And then the, the final thing I'll say uh, is that although the charges that we face represent potential decades in prison, the truth is that it, the likelihood of those things is quite small, um, and that the, the sentencing guidelines mean that basically what we are likely to face is somewhere between months and a few years in, in jail or prison, depending on, on where and how long. Um, and that's really different. I mean, I don't know about you, but I can imagine spending months, for sure, uh, in jail, you know, even a year or two, if I think it'll make a difference to, like, what's happening in the world. Yeah. You know, if, it's, if somebody tells me I'm going to go to jail for 21 years, which is the maximum that I'm facing, like, that feels really just very, 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 very different. And so, you know, again, like, when you talk about a young person potentially facing decades in prison, the odds of that actually are very slender. Without priors, without much in the way of damage, it, 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 it's still in this country at this moment, who knows what's gonna happen, you know, starting in a few months, but that is not actually really in the cards as, as a likelihood at all. A little bit to the, uh, the young folks out there too. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, myself included. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit scary to think, oh, you know, I'm facing all this with my whole life ahead of me. But, like, ask yourself, what kind of life is that ahead of you? That's not right. taking this action, that's too. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, so that's, that's really important. And it's also, it's important perspective for me, like, thinking, oh, you know, um, far better people have paid far more for doing much less, you know, like Fred Hampton of the Black Panthers or somebody like that, you know. Uh, murdered for just getting people, you know, united in Chicago. So things like that are like, oh, so I'm really, you know, it's scary being where I'm at, but, um, you know, I'm part of this whole long line of people who have faced a lot worse um, for, you know, doing even less direct things than this. So it's, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's scary, but it's a risk that I think even for young people with our lives ahead of us, such as they are, um, <laughs> it's still, it's still, you know, a risk that you know we shouldn't uh, say that. Oh, we can't take this because we're young. So. Um, so you're dealing with a lot of fear. You're dealing with anything between, you know, a month, maybe nothing, maybe a month, maybe 21 years. How how are you all keeping yourself going? Is there any sort of um, uh, spiritual practice or personal practice that is helping you deal with the uncertainty of your situations? Yeah, I, I feel like the prospect of going to prison or jail has really improved the quality of my, of my life. 
because I'm doing a whole set of things around exercise and meditation and so forth that I've been planning to do for years, and now I'm actually... <laughs> My, my sweetie here, Laura, is taking me to a six-week meditation uh, day. day. I'm sorry. <laughs> time, time doesn't have the same. <laughs> I get up in the morning every once in a while and run these days and lift weights and shit. Um, we've had awesome support um, from this whole community, and I think, um, yeah, I take my own, I guess, strength and inspiration from these young folks like Reed. Um, there are so many young activists in Seattle who are so inspiring to me. Um, I'm just in awe of the organizing work that goes on um, at an age when I was an activist, but I was sure not very organized or effective at that age, and these guys just blow me away. So that's really, um, honestly, what keeps me going is um, my surrogate kids here in Seattle. <laughs> All right. Yeah, running in the community. Those are the two things. Um, so for me, it's it's just uh, really simple. Um, doing nothing isn't acceptable, and and uh, and so finding something I can do is a big relief versus just watching what's happening and not acting. If we all stick together, though, they can't jail all of us. <laughs> left so I'd like to leave it open for final thoughts that you all would like to share with this um, tremendously supportive group of people. Yeah I'm in North Dakota and I'm going to prison. I know that. I grew up in Houston, Texas where the Keystone Pipeline ends. And it felt so great to <laughs> shut off that pipeline. <laughs> so we're mounting the necessity defense, and I'm going to try to prove to a jury of my farmer peers <laughs> that what I did was not a crime because I was protecting their crops. Yeah. I was protecting their fields, and I was protecting their kids. I probably won't win, but I'm going to do a heck of a job trying to convince them yeah. and opening up that conversation, opening up that door. Um, when I come out of prison, whenever that is, um, the world is going to be different. If it's in 2019, if it's in 2021, if it's in 2025, I'm going to be in a world where our chance of getting back to a stable climate, 350 parts per million, is no more. I was a mental health counselor for 20 years. And I tried to help people figure out how to be more well-adjusted in a pathological culture. Yeah. Yeah. So I quit. And now I'm trying to fix that pathological culture. When I come out of prison, I don't want to be a mental health counselor. I'm not sure I'm cut out for the kind of work that therapists are going to be doing in the year 2025. Yeah. When we live in a, on a planet without a future. So if there's something you can do now, do it now.
I'm asking everybody to cut your emissions 10% per year. I'm asking you to plant your fair share of one trillion trees. That's one new tree for every three trees on earth. You can count them like this. That's how I count them with the kids in schools where I speak. And we're going to do that. That's 150 trees for each one of you. 150 trees for each one of us makes one trillion. Isn't that crazy? So do your part. Cut your emissions 10% every year. Plant your 150 trees. Plant 150 for somebody in Bangladesh. And uh, don't wait if you have a vision, if you have an idea, if there's something you can do to start the conversation. Thank you. I feel like that's a very fine place to finish. Will you all join me in standing and saying thank you yes. to these folks? Yeah. Thank you. and being more involved and helping on the support team, who do they talk to? Nikki, right here. Talk to Nikki. Nikki. If you need a space to get involved, to be part of the resistance, tomorrow night, 350 Seattle is holding our Pledge of Resistance. Again, we've got a meeting. Thursday. Oh, it's only, it's earlier in the week than I thought. We are, uh, yeah. Talk to Jen here in the red. She's got cards. It is on Thursday. You can plug in, be part of the resistance, make that pledge. Um, I think I'll be there after hearing this tonight. <laughs> so, right. if any of you have friends, contacts, etc., in Minnesota, North Dakota, or Montana, there are going to be trials going on in those places in the next six to nine months, and we don't have a lot of contacts. So, if you have friends, let the support team know. Um, we're going to need people to help us there. Seriously. Thank you all. All right.